I feel for this road with the speeds I'm going, second, third gear, highly technical, some smooth sections, some really, really bumpy sections. What we have is phenomenal. And literally, when I'm riding it, I'm giggling. Please subscribe to help you and your motorcycle perform better. Ta-da! Brand new MV Augusta F3800. For us to go through, fit correctly, test different settings, look at geometry. So thank you very much, MV Augusta USA. Really appreciate this opportunity to work with a bike and provide a lot of information for other owners around the world that will be able to take advantage of what we produce here. So let's take a seat. Now, I have a 2014 F3800. This is a lot newer. So we're going to start with a clean sheet on this one. So first thing is to feel where the seat wants you to be because some seats shove you into the tank and this does not. The other part is, like an R6, the tank comes up here so there's no structural support for your gut at all because when you come forward, it just gives you that cantilever to come until you get to about this angle. Then my stomach touches. So at that point, you're in the attack position already. You just bring your arms in and you're right where you're supposed to be. First most important measurement <coughs> for me is how far is it from the steering stem to my belly button? What's our physical reach? So let's put that where I want it, right in the center. Right about there. Well, 59, 58 and a half centimeters. So that's important to know because depending on your spine length, that might be nice and tight if you have a long spine or short, it may be a very, very long reach and extremely uncomfortable where your shoulder blades are coming apart to go reach the bars. Next thing is where are my knees? Well, we're right here, right on this compound curve. So if I'm looking at riding normally and I always ride on my toes, I do not ride here. Then at that point, you can see whether I move my feet, my knee stays, stays in this position. So because this is a compound curve on both sides, if you're going to use tank grips, you need a piece to come here and then you need a piece shaped for this. So the beauty is these come off really easily, really quickly. So you can shape by a big piece from someone like TechSpec and then go ahead and cut your own custom shapes and make that work. So for me, I'm not going to feel the compound curves. I can feel it with no leathers on, but that's going to make grip a little awkward because the compound curve is right on the inside of my knee. But again, with leathers, I won't be able to feel that. So as I come forward, because I work with my hands, I'm comfortable here. So when I look at the position of my fist to the bars, the grips are a little on the narrow side. So if I want to come naturally, I'm here. And that gives me a good feeling on both sides. So going here, I can yeah, I can feel it pull on the back of my shoulders here coming in. So that's a little too narrow given my broad shoulders. I'm going to be much more comfortable on the latter half of the grip. So that's fine. It'll just be a position that I ride in to be more comfortable. When I reach forward, my shoulder blades don't open at all this way to get to the bike. So I'm good there. Gap for reach. So we can see the brake lever is nowhere near where I need it to be. We are on number three. So let's see if number one is the furthest. It is. So that's about right for me. But I have to accelerate into a braking situation. So our brake lever has to be dropped. And we'll get to that in a bit. Yeah. So we've got to lower that a little bit because I, I have to do this. The distance is good. I can get there fairly quickly, but I'm going to hit. So as far as the clutch goes, that angle straight down, the placement we have right now works very nicely for me. 
The clutch lever has no adjustment. The clutch free play is correct on the gap, one to two millimeters. So current setting with the clutch is, not, is fine. So we'll leave that alone. Then in regards to placement, because I want my fingers towards the outs, my hands towards the outside, then that fits perfectly. Fingertip is over and it pulls back. It doesn't wrap underneath and pull up. So placement wise, that's gonna be fine. Speed of movement is quick, distance is correct. So fortunately, the clutch lever itself, being non-adjustable, is perfect for me and I you generally wear a, um, wear a large glove, not an XL, because my fingers are extremely small compared to my palm. So that's great news on the clutch. So now we've got to look at moving the brake down if we can. So obviously it's never moved. There's the original paint pen marks. Everything's where it's supposed to be. We have quite a bit of free play in our rubber line here. So that's not a problem at all. That will allow it to come down. So the next point is, okay, where's everything else? So under here, we've got cables for the kill switch. So it looks like the brake line is in the being offset. And in all the videos, we talk about brake lines being clocked at 12 o'clock, and it is. So that's awesome, fantastic. Now the question is, one, once we loosen the bolt, is there a pin holding the master cylinder in the set location on the bar? And we've seen that quite a lot with more bikes these days. Or are we free to move this? Let's lift up first. So there's no pin. So at that point, now we know we can get the right angle. There's no pinch, no stress in this line. Just let's pull that back to there. There we go. Now let's try this angle and see if this is what we need for me so I'm not accelerating into a braking situation. So now what I wanna do is be able to come forward quickly without my palm going backwards. So that needs to be just a hair lower. Okay, that's better. So everything now is in a perfect straight line from forearm down through to here. And it's very quick to get to the brakes and we've already sized this reach. So we can go ahead now and say, this looks like it'll work, let's go firm up the brake, put the paint pen lines back to where they were so they match. And then in terms of reach and angle, I've got what I need for the test ride. The other part is the seat narrows, where the seat narrows and comes back. You can feel that on your sit bones. So it's gonna be interesting. It's probably obviously a lot more comfortable up here with the edges of the seat once I get my leathers on and go ride. But outside of that, when you put your feet down, your feet come straight through the middle of the bike so that your legs aren't coming out like this off of the seat. So they come down naturally and the beauty for me, the great thing is that the foot pegs are not in the way. Either way, you wanna put your feet down, you can put them down. You don't have to go either side of the peg. They're right where they're supposed to be. You want your ankle to be right under the ball and socket joint, which is there. So at this point, my ankle's just a little bit too far back. If I flex my ankle to here, that also corrects the thigh angle into the tank. So technically, for me to be more comfortable, I'd need my foot peg up and slightly forward. So to do that, put your thigh where you want it to be first. That's where the fitment piece is and then your foot's free to dangle. Put your heel level with the ball joint, which is right there, and that's where the foot peg needs to be. For me, that's with a 30 inch inseam. Uh, brake pedal, straight to it, no issues at all there. The brake pedal's perfectly positioned, and I have a size nine shoe, so just before the heel, foot goes onto the brake pedal and it fits right on the ball of my foot. So for a size nine US foot, 
that works perfect. Now as far as the shifter goes, I've got CD boots which are really thin leather on the top. So when I put my foot underneath, if my heel stop is against the peg, then I've got to find out where the shifter piece is on my foot. And it's actually behind my big toe, not my preference. That's my preference. So the shift is actually a little too close for my size nine shoe. The other piece of the puzzle is that the top of the shift point, which is there, my ankle cannot be less than 90 degrees. And if it is less than 90 degrees, then it is doing a very unnatural action. So I feel feels close, but I also think it needs to go down slightly, but we'll see after the test ride and see where we get to. So the next thing to check is stiction for the front forks. The bike is brand new, no stiction. Drops straight back down, which is what you would expect. So stiction's not an issue at all, so that's great. I didn't find in the book what stock settings are, so we're gonna go see what we have. We're assuming that nothing's been touched, but that's a bad assumption. Each leg is separate, so we have rebound in the right leg and compression in the left leg, the flathead screws, and we have a 22 millimeter nut, which is preload only, and we have one of those for each leg. So we'll start with hydraulics on rebound. We always wanna go as per clicks, turns and faces video. With hydraulics, you always go clockwise to start, so half one, half two. So rebound is set at two turns out. Compression, half one, half two, two exactly. Half one, half two. Now for preload, we go the opposite way. We are gonna go counterclockwise because preload is counted from minimum in. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, just over six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's check the other one and it should be identical. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, six. Okay. So now we're looking at the top of the shock. We've got our yellow spring and we have our two castle nuts. The one against the spring is the adjusting nut and the one up top here is the locking nut. And what we wanna do is count the number of threads that we can see. Now I pre-counted them and there are nine threads showing from the top of the lock nut here all the way up to there. So as far as shock preload goes, you would write down nine threads showing. Now we're looking at compression, which is the top of the shock and we've got a flathead screw. So as with all hydraulics, go clockwise first. So seat the screwdriver, half one, half two, just over two, two and an eighth. So half one, half two and an eighth. And then buried at the bottom of the shock, so that again is our rebound adjuster. That's a flathead screw. So half, one, half, two, half, three, three. So let's put it back. Half, oops, huh. one, half, two, Two and a half and three. So we're back to where we started with in our settings. Before we ride, we need to know where maximum travel is. So as per all videos, especially the one that we made for you on fork bottom out, 
We know from the book that maximum travel in the front forks is 125 millimeters, because I read the book. We have exactly 130 millimeters. So five millimeters up from the end of the chrome tube will be physical bottom. We need to go ahead and put a little black dot, as after all, this is a press bike. But in paying it forward to all future journalists that ride this bike, marking bottom out for them will give them context about how much travel they're using. So, is it a bad thing that I'm doing? No, I'm paying it forward here. So, five millimeters up. It's going to be there. Okay, so we know that that's bottom. Trusty cable tie or zip tie has to go on so we can see how much trouble, travel, trouble, geez, subliminal slip there. See how much travel <laughs> we're gonna use while we're doing the setup ride. Again, get it snug, check that it moves freely but it requires physical strength to move it. That's pretty good. I don't think we need one more notch. Trim it. <clears throat> now we have to check static sag and see where we're at. Again, we know what extended was on the front. With the bike standing up under its own weight, we have 104. So 26 millimeters of static in the front. Now remember, static sag is engineered in with top out springs. Not much we can do with that, it just is what it is. And now we need to go switch to the rear, which is gonna require both of us. Okay, so the first thing to do is measure where the bike is sitting under its own weight, and then Dave's gonna go ahead and pick it up. We've gotta measure from two points, so I'm going from the axle nut all the way up to a sharp point here on the bodywork. That measurement, is 85 millimeters. All right, Dave, pull her up and let it go. Right, push it down twice for me. One, okay, I'm up again. Let it go. So we're at 10 millimeters right now, static. So that's our, your base minimum is 10 to 15, ideal 12 to 15. Uh, it might be worth taking a turn of spring off, we'll see, based on how the bike rides. Next step, measure rider sag, and I'm riding the bike, so it's got to be set up for me, so I'll go ahead and sit on the bike. Does it matter if you've got gear or no gear at this point? We just need to know where we're at. It's a starting point because the settings will change as we test on the ride, so assume the position. Dave will measure from the same two points. Five. 58. 558. So 55 to 85 would be 30 minus 3 is 27. But again, I'm not in gear plus the 10, so 37. So technically, we're probably going to be in the 40s on the back. All right, Dave, now that's set. Now we'll set rider sag for the front. We know what the back is. Compress the front a few times, let it average out. 90. So 90 to 104 is 14 millimeters plus 26 is 40. So we're sitting roughly 40, 40. So mathematically, we're within a couple of millimeters off the showroom floor, which is awesome. Don't often get that, so that's brilliant. Right. Wait, so that's you at what weight? Ah, uh, I am currently at 207 pounds. Mm. So for me at 180, it might be perfect. It will, pro it will probably be on the money. But it's not me, it's you right now. Okay, yes. moving on. So, yes. All right, Mr. Williams is 180 pounds and trimming. So 585 is 563. 22 in the back. Yeah, because you were 558, so that's five. Yeah. Another five mil. Another five mil less. 
and on the front we are 95 millimeters with you on it. And you are 90. Yeah, so. Five front and rear. Five front and rear. Now, correct the preload setting if you found the numbers were way out of whack. I have an inkling, but at roughly 40 40, especially for the initial ride, a little bit of plushness and the bike sitting pretty much damn well flat even. I'm very happy with that, so I'm not going to skip the step. Looking at the numbers, what I'm going to go do with the bike, I'm quite happy with 4040, so I'm not going to change our preload settings for the fork or the shock yet. Let's do our rebound evaluation of the back of the bike first. And remember, with just 279 miles on the bike, the oil is brand new, so hot to cold variance is not going to be a great deal at all. So in this case, for rebound in the back, remember we've got high speed bumps, big thump, and then we have rolling down the road, low speed bumps or slow movement. So first one is slow movement. Well that doesn't jump up and then hitting a bigger bump, you actually can see the wheel shake. because these will flex. You'll see them shake. So in looking at that as the shock has initial energy put into it, it comes back quickly. As that pressure depletes or reduces, then the speed coming towards the top of the stroke slows right down, which puts just a little shimmy in it. So I'm gonna go in a quarter turn clockwise on rebound. Okay, about the same on the smaller bumps and the big bump, much smoother, way better. I think I'm gonna leave that right there. So we've gone a quarter turn clockwise on rebound. Now on the front, that does not wanna come back. Wow, okay, so let's take all the rebound out. So that was another turn and a quarter out. Let's see if we can get rebound at its minimum value and see if we can fail it. Yes, awesome, so the range of damping is excellent. Now let's go in quarter turn increments, clockwise, to get rid of our second bounce. Oh, hello. <laughs> so quarter turn, Gone already. So interesting that a quarter turn on the needle made a profound difference in fork flow rate. Now bike is beautifully balanced with cold oil but we'll see how that works when the bike is hot. So our last job is compression and you want to find your total range and put it smack in the middle. So let's get to work. So we're gonna pull all the compression out. So half, one, two, three, three and three quarters. So that will be one and three quarters. So half, one, half, and three quarters. Now let's take a look at our shock compression. Let's go all the way out so we can get our count. So half, one, two, three, three and a quarter. So it's exactly the same. So one and three quarters, half, half, three quarters. So we're bang in the middle. Now we've got to check pressure obviously before every ride. Awesome, right angle valve stems, yes, fantastic. Makes it life so much easier. And it is 15 degrees Celsius for most of the world. And that equates to 58 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're gonna check our pressure and see where we're at. 
currently we are at 28.1 and of course the front is hidden so let's do the old trick kickstand lift rotate and we are at 28.7 in the front hmm Diablo Rosso Corsa 2, correct. Normally, normally on these, on a street ride, I'd prefer about 34 minimum. So I'm gonna go ahead and add some air to these tires and put them at 34 on my gauge based on this ambient temperature. I don't have a passenger, I don't have a big heavy backpack, I don't have a load on the back of the bike and no saddlebags. So I'm going to start at 34 even. This is our textbook approach to the initial setting. So what we've done here is we have everything as a known setting. The next thing we have to do now is go out into the real world and see if those known settings apply. And if they don't, why do we need to change them? So next thing, suit up, go ride. So we've got the quick shifter as well, which makes things a little nicer, a little easier. So we're going to try this out with the settings that the bike came with. Except that we've changed the rebound in the front and the rear only. Everything else remains the same. So as we go, start scrubbing the tires in and getting a little heat into them. Cautious because it's bloody cold today. And these roads are notoriously bumpy because up here we're at a pretty good elevation. So they get a lot of snow damage and a lot of chained vehicles. So we'll take our time getting up to the top. And there's a couple of switchbacks that require your attention, so we just approach them slowly just in case of gravel and somebody deciding to cut the corner. So bike transitions nicely, not much effort required to increase lean angle. Nicely balanced and agile, moves easily, but it doesn't move too quick. So. Decide where you want to be early and let it go and it goes and stays so with oil temperature as it is right now I'm not getting too much in the way of imbalance from the chassis which is fine by me bumps so far the slightly sharper edge bumps are definitely sharp there's no question about that. Again though, oil temp is cold. We're just starting our first run to see what we can figure out to get the oil hot. And then once oil's hot, we can come back and set rebound correctly and go that route. So most of these corners are gonna be second and third gear, no question. Again, on the initial ride, there's no rush. Ambient right now is in the 50s. So it's a little on the cool side, shall we say? <laughs> that being said, the shock will heat up faster from the heat of the engine. The forks are still out in that cool air. So because of that, Forks are going to take a minute to warm up. So always, especially when you start riding, be careful with your front end. Give it a good, a good 20 minutes to warm up. So the oil is hot enough so you don't deflect off a bump and lose the front. All right, so downhill is much harder on brakes. So now we'll see how the front end dips, dives, and behaves. 
with braking and load and how the front end behaves with a lot more proportional balance on it. And the beauty now is we can also use engine braking and having seen the road coming up we know for the most part that it's pretty clear and of course in braking well just when we get back to Dave we'll go ahead and see how much travel we've used and how that relates to the current setup and the initial ride to see if we need to soften it up a little bit Probably a lot more second gear than third going uphill as we're coming down to leverage the engine braking, so past the substation. pumps are getting ever so slightly smaller ever so slightly but again like we said for the four four coil is going to take a minute to warm up so we've got to be patient now I'm a little bit more aggressive braking the front end does dip. Yeah, it does. All right, ride number one. Um, Took a long time for the forks to heat up, but we're in the 50s here, so it's cold. And that is no surprise at all. The front end felt really rough. Open verdict. Uh, the back end came in and was actually quite nice once the shot got hot, which was about 10 minutes into the ride. Um, acceleration, power down, holding its line uh, in terms of coming out of the corners. Speed's so slow relatively speaking that that's not going to be something i care about what i care about more is corner entry so on uphills you don't break a whole lot on downhills i deliberately over braked and screwed up the line in the corner and went in too deep too fast to assess what we've got for braking so from the rosso twos we have phenomenal grip i was not worried at all about that but what we did get was poof through the stroke so let's take a look at what we've got. In terms of travel, we're very close to the bottom already and just very slow speeds and not that aggressive in braking, but a little towards a panic stop. So we know that we're getting down here. It's excessive because I'd like to have another eight to 10 mil available to me just in case. On the front tire, we have a boatload of upside down clouds. And we have them in two tones. We have them in that kind of mustard color and we have them in the black color as well. So the front end is showing that it's working the bottom of the stroke, which the cable tie confirms. And then the pattern of the upside, clouds, upside down clouds is all over the place. So the tire's doing a lot of flexing, trying to cope with a rough road at slow speed with heavy brakes. So we need to stop the fork travel being so fast and going through the stroke. And the first way to do that is to actually add some compression to it. So we started with two turns out on the beginning of the ride. So we're gonna go to half one and a quarter. And we're gonna see what that does. Now we know on the rebound side that when we made that quarter turn, the bounce in the front went away. So the next thing we've got to do is now that the fork oil is hot is assess what is our fork action and is the setting we've got and some of the problems we're facing the fork popping. It doesn't feel like it, but we've got to check it. So let's go ahead and check rebound. Do we have a catastrophic second bounce? Yes, clearly 
and a lot. So let's try that next quarter turn. It's gone. Now let's go back an eighth of a turn. Let's go back a sixteenth more. So what we thought was pretty aggressive on the taper is clearly proving itself to be the case. There's the fail. Yep. So just a sixteenth with hot oil on rebound cures the problem right away. All right. Let's look at the rear. And while we're getting a decent amount of lean angle going already, the hard compound is nice and smooth. Lots and lots of black dots in the soft compound. And again, enormous amounts of upside down clouds in two tones. So that would suggest that the back of the bike, even though we're on the power, where we pick the throttle up here, it's a nice smooth band. And that band throughout here is pretty consistent, but you can see how much flex the tire is doing. So once we're on the throttle and we get the gray band coming in, it's fairly consistent, but we were concerned that rebound may be too fast in the back. So it's failing. So if we watch the tire against the exhaust, there's a clear second bounce there too. So another quarter turn on shock rebound. There it is. Let's try that again. No second bounce. So the very rewarding thing to, about the latest model is that a sixteenth on the front and a quarter turn on the rear makes visually a profound difference. So I'm not sure if they changed all viscosity and or valving was changed internally, but that level of sensitivity is really great to see. Right, let's go ahead and test out the changes we made. We want to have more braking stability, so on brake pressure, the fork doesn't drop too quickly. And then we want more chassis balance for mid-corner, specifically, and deceleration. So, lots of uphills at the moment, and slow, and some are going to get a little quicker. So, the part there is we want to sample everything not just fast corners. We want to see how it works across the spectrum, especially now as the fork oil is hot. So, do I need to trail brake? Not really. Super smooth engine braking helps me out a lot. So just a little bit of brake. Another sharp corner coming up, so we'll brake excessively. No huge dip there like the previous setting. The other part is the bike is solid as a rock on its side. So there's no issue at all with mid-corner stability. The other part that's a huge benefit is that I can sustain throttle position and I can lean for longer carrying a little more speed than before because the bike's perfectly planted underneath me. So, tremendous amount of stability that we've gained from balancing, balancing rebound front and rear. Now uphill obviously you don't use a ton of brakes, it's going to be more the downhill test of what we need. So, at this point, aggressive braking again, no dip. Enough weight transfer for the front to grip but certainly no dive like we had before. One more time, yeah. And like I said, on its side, the bike is absolutely planted. And in being planted, that means I am much more comfortable in getting the bike through the corners while leaning and using the throttle positively. So, example, brake. Set your threshold, gas on, 
Keep the throttle on. Keep the radius going. Set her up for the corner, drive through the corner and away. So, beautiful change on the uphill section. So let's turn around. So downhill is much, much, much more braking. So we also generally try and trail brake a little bit. Carry the brake lever into the corner. But if we've got braking stability, we can do our threshold brake release. Bit of gas on downhill or off camber. Plant the chassis, there it is. Brake, let go. Because it's so planted, it's a piece of cake now to get the bike through the downhill corners, even with neutral throttle. So that's a fantastic piece of the puzzle that we didn't get before, because we'd have to brake all the way through the corner, and then getting through the corner, then we could go. So at this point now, I don't even need to trail brake. I set my entry speed, let go, bring it around, and use the gas, the neutral throttle, to bring it through the corner. So downhill, stability-wise, great. The beauty of that is much more corner speed going downhill too. So overall, between the changes we made, both uphill and downhill feel fantastic. So let's call it right here, come off. I'm really happy with those changes. I don't see any need to make them any different at this point. This setup is phenomenal. So how did that show in the tires and how did we get an improvement? Let's go to the back. We actually used a little more lean angle even on that short session because it gave so much confidence. Yes, the upside clouds are upside down clouds are there. They're much closer to the edge of the tire. But the important thing to recognize is that from the join of the soft compound down, that is a much, much straighter line in the gray around the tire. So where we're picking the throttle up here and getting the throttle on, there's a lot more stability, a lot more. So let's switch to the other side and see if that holds true on lefts and rights. Well, same thing applies. We're into Rosso and straight line up and up so the rebound adjustment in the back for stability took that big second bounce away gave the back of the bike a lot more confidence and traction that's also true if you look at the words each upper letter is fine there's no distortion whatsoever on that so huge improvement on the back on the front not so much gain in angle obviously but same thing applies. Smooth on the soft compound, but nowhere near as flat a, a band here in width and consistent a band as the rear. So at this point, we have gray dots or black dots up here, and we have quite a few in the softer compound as well. What that means for us, and for me in particular when I'm riding the bike is, with that change in compression and the way in which it slowed down the descent, we're stressing the tire. And if we're stressing the tire, that should give us a little more grip. If that gives us more grip, it gives us more confidence on corner entry, which in turn will give us higher lean angles for longer periods of time. So where I'm at right now, and this is only the second part of the dial in, and I'm close to bottom, I feel for this road with the speeds I'm going, second, third gear, highly technical, some smooth sections, some really, really bumpy sections. What we have is phenomenal. And literally, when I'm riding it, I'm giggling. Now that we've done the first part of the testing, which is fun riding on a tight technical highway, uh, 190 here in Springville, and getting the settings really where I want them to be so that it is finely balanced, it initiates the turn, stays in the turn, and mid-corner it offers tremendous stability. Where am I? Well, I'm at six turns in on preload on the forks, I'm at one and a quarter in 
on compression. I am at three turns out on rebound. Preload on the rear shock is unchanged. Compression is one and three quarters and rebound is two and a quarter. So at that point, for tight technical work, especially heavy downhill braking as well, I still managed to get it to bottom out. So, do I need to work more on compression and preload combinations? Yes, I do. But what's great is I have room. At one and a quarter out on compression, that gives me room. With the preload, we've just started going in on preload with six turns. So at my weight in gear, we're looking about 220, 225. If you are a relatively aggressive rider, then this is going to be wonderful with the settings we've got and I haven't even touched the shock preload yet to get really excellent wear on the tires as well. So at that weight range of 180, well you'll probably pull maybe some preload out, maybe at three, three and a half, compression at one and three quarters. Uh, the shock setting, probably pull off a couple of turns of preload and open up half a turn of compression which is great because now we're going somewhere around a 40 pound difference and still with the stock suspension be able to get it to work for us no problem at all. Now if you're a little lighter, if you're in the 140 range then uh, it's going to be difficult with the springs that are in it especially if you have good ability and you do like to be aggressive with the motorcycle we're not talking track here, we're talking streets then it might be the case that with zero preload, compression two and a half out and rebound all the way out in the forks, plus on the back, I, I don't know, two and a half on rebound and probably three on compression, that at that point, we'd have to take a look at the travel you were using in the shock in the forks to see if your ability overrode your physical weight and so you could get the motorcycle to work. Um, geometry, there's been no change. For me, the geometry is absolutely flawless. There is zero desire for me to do this. So I am very, very impressed with the out of the box offering for the latest version because it's so easy to ride and flick. And as soon as now with these settings you initiate, it's right there. We kept the power and the traction control and the, all the settings on the dash the same for the test because that's how the bike's delivered and that's the best way to test it at that level. So what's next? Well, what's next is to ride it now where I'm comfortable with it a little bit more aggressively and figure out, okay, at higher speeds, are these suspension settings appropriate? Do we need different suspension settings because it's not stop, start, second, third gear, maybe fourth. It's going to be third, fourth, fifth, maybe sixth. So wider roads, longer corners, giving you more corner speed. Going to be interesting to see where we go. The other part is now also in that regard, getting out of the settings that were presented and then figuring out now some different settings. So getting out of the sport map, looking at traction control, what does it do? Does it offer stuff? Can we feel it? How does that work? Where is it intrus intrusive and where it is not? So we'll figure that one out. But for me, the highlight of the bike, strange as it may sound, is engine braking. I said we would not do a comparison to the 2014 that I own, but in this case, in rolling off, the engine braking is so smooth and effective. It is not abrupt. You don't smash into the tank. It's wonderful. And it gives you a lot of encouragement, especially going uphill, to not bother with the brakes at all because your engine braking is smooth and efficient and effective. So those are all the positives. Negative? Useless. 100% useless. Can't see them don't work. I put the lens where I want it to be and within 20 feet it's down at the bottom. Now that may be a defective mirror but with my height at 5'10 in my body position unless I duck my head down I can't even get to see the glass. So if there's something that I would dearly love for MVE to change 
it would be mirrors that are wider and higher so people of different spine lengths can see the mirror easier and if you position the mirror where you want it that the vibration doesn't flick it down back to its resting spot. But that's the only negative for the bike that I have. The rest of it is just honestly pretty stunning and what we're getting off the showroom floor with a little bit of dial in time the experience truly is glorious. So now on to the next phase of testing. Dave Moss can tune your suspension no matter where you are on the planet via his remote tuning service. Contact Dave on Facebook or by email dave at davemosstuning.com.